Hi, it's Greg Dalton. I'd like to hear your comments on the show, topics we should cover, and guest suggestions. You can reach me at greg at climateone.org. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. To limit climate disruption, we need to pull vast amounts of carbon dioxide out of the sky. We're now in a place where focusing on emissions reductions alone is, is just not enough. And as important as that is, we still need to do something about all of those legacy emissions that are out there already. Nature already has many ways of doing this. Peatlands, which represent only about 3% of the world's terrestrial surface, store twice as much carbon as all the world's forests combined. So as carbon storage reservoirs, they're unmatched. So how can we maximize those powerful tools? If you were to take less than 4% of U.S. waters, to farm seaweed, you could offset the entire agricultural carbon emissions of California. Can humans use and improve upon the Earth's natural methods of capturing and storing carbon? A new IPCC report out this week further details the gravity of our inaction on climate change, predicting increasingly dire disruption to natural systems and billions of people around the world. Many of these climate hazards are here now and are accelerating. We really are in sort of a tipping point on climate change. I think that people are realizing that the risks are very real, they're upon us, and we're behind in sort of getting out in front of this particular challenge. Later in the show, we'll hear from one of the authors of the report, which strengthens the case for going beyond merely reducing emissions. We need to start sucking existing carbon dioxide out of the sky. Ugbad Kosar is Deputy Director of Policy at Carbon 180, a nonprofit focused on carbon removal. So we're talking about billions of tons of carbon that is just out there. And that carbon stays in the atmosphere for centuries. And unfortunately, because of years of inaction, uh, in some cases, obfuscation and distraction from extractive industries, and ultimately the failure to aggressively stop our carbon emissions we're now in a place where focusing on emissions reductions alone is, is just not enough. Carbon dioxide removal projects can generally be divided between nature-based solutions like growing trees and tech-based solutions that are basically giant filters that pull CO2 out of the air. In both cases, the hope is to store that carbon for decades or longer. Next time, we'll take a deep dive into tech-based solutions. Today, we're focused on nature-based solutions like reforestation, regenerative agriculture, peatlands, and kelp. Kosar says it's difficult to rank them because they all have unique benefits and are appropriate in different contexts. When you look at something like their efficacy or ability to remove carbon, it does largely depend on what practices are being applied in what geographies, under which climate, and then even more granularity under which crop or tree type. That being said, when you look at something like forestry, it's probably the first thing that comes to mind for people as it is nature's own carbon removal machines. Existing U.S. forests already capture nearly 12% of our domestic emissions each year. So that's not an insignificant number. And if we are to apply different practices like reforestation, planting more trees or improved management, so thinking about ways to change the way we manage our forests to increase carbon stocks, we're able to actually increase uh, this carbon removal potential to be hundreds of millions of carbon dioxide each year. So that's a really significant number. And oftentimes reforestation is, is the one pathway that's the single largest opportunity. When you look at the agriculture side, which is sort of the second predominant land-based approach, this is essentially using our agricultural soils to capture and store carbon, something that already happens naturally, but by applying different practices, there are studies that show that U.S. agricultural soils have the capacity to sequester up to 10% of domestic emissions each year. In addition to the carbon piece, they bring so many additional co-benefits outside of carbon. So whether it's cleaner air, cleaner water, in some contexts, improved productivity uh, and increased resilience to climate change. But there are limitations to these approaches. Right. So you can solve climate and solve a bunch of other problems as well. There's a lot of talk these days about durability, durability of policy, because we've seen states and countries zig and zag on climate, 
Uh, there's also durability of these types of solutions. You know, planting trees sounds good, but just planting a tree doesn't mean it's going to grow to maturity and trees burn. Yes. So when you look at durability, sometimes you may hear people say permanence as well. So the permanence of the carbon that's being stored. Ultimately, we want carbon to be stored as long as possible. Um, that being said, we're talking about a living system. So carbon is going to just move through these li living systems. It's just a natural cyclical process. So no matter what we do, some amounts of carbon are just naturally going to be released back into the atmosphere through things like respiration. Climate change is also putting pressure on durability of carbon storage. Referring back to the wildfires, for example, we're seeing that as much management as we want to do and as much as we want to think about forest carbon management, a lot of those wildfires are just releasing that carbon right back into the atmosphere and therefore just getting back into that vicious cycle. So what we really need to hone in on for land-based carbon removal is something called monitoring, reporting, and verification, or MRV. This is really important because we need to better understand how carbon is actually moving through these systems and how much is actually being stored so that we are really meeting the climate goals that we're setting out to meet. For forestry, there is a tree nursery capacity issue. This is a major limiting factor when we think about reforestation. You need nurseries that help provide the seeds and the seedlings that are then going to be planted. Unfortunately, where we're at today, we need to actually increase annual production about 2.4 fold to meet the reforestation goals out there. So which ones of these work without human management and which don't need our help? Is it better to turn it in, in carbon into rocks, for example, than into soil or trees? So you can just leave a forest alone and it will be able to go through its photosynthesis processes. Unfortunately, because of climate change, it's not able to do that as well as it used to. So no matter what approach you look at, some amount of human intervention at this point is needed, unfortunately. So when I think about things like nature-based versus tech-based, sometimes that dichotomy gives the image of nature-based being natural, as in without human intervention, and technology being essentially of, of human intervention. And that's just not the case of where we're at right now. As much as we would love to allow these systems to just regenerate on their own and do what they need to do, which can happen in some cases, there is still a need for some amounts of human intervention with really any sort of climate mitigation strategy we're looking at right now. Yeah, I can't just put it on autopilot. What do you think of biomass energy with carbon capture and storage, where plant material is burned to produce energy, but the carbon is captured and somehow stored? The idea is this could be a power source with negative carbon emissions. Some of these ideas in the past, burning wood pellets, have turned out to be highly problematic. So what's your thought on that? The bioenergy space can be confusing uh, and, and hard to navigate truthfully. I think what's helpful is walking people through an example. So if you were to imagine that you work on a farm and you've harvested your crops for the year, you look back at the field and you see the stover that's left there. So your leftover leaves and your stalks, uh, you have to do something with that before your next planting season. Something that's happening now in, in many cases is just open burns. So you just pile up all those leftovers and then you burn it. And obviously this is gonna emit carbon, it's a fire. Uh, there's a lot of air quality implications, especially for surrounding communities, oftentimes our environmental justice communities and just other effects like that. So this option that you're mentioning is you use that leftover pile as quote unquote feedstock or a source of energy. And then you can burn it in a facility, as you mentioned, to convert whatever those leftovers are into useful things like energy or fuel. And then the facility is also able to capture that carbon emitted uh, from the burning process and store it underground. But it's really important to know that there's a lot of concerns, there's a lot of questions and uncertainties in how we're actually going to be able to scale bioenergy systems without having impacts on land, or having impacts on people, or having impacts on other resources that we need, and still do it in a really sustainable way. Regenerative agriculture is the concept that certain practices like no-till, 
farming or planting cover crops or planting trees near farms, known as agroforestry, can sequester carbon rather than releasing it. Uh, what's the potential for that? I mean, there are a lot of a lot of benefits for things like regenerative agriculture. I think with climate smart ag practices, this is language that is used a lot more by the USDA now, actually. They recently in, uh, announced that they're investing a billion dollars in quote unquote climate smart commodities. However, agro businesses are the ones that are actually co-opting this conversation, I find. So their sort of end game is actually markets and offsets, in, in my opinion, rather than really fundamentally cutting down emissions from their supply chains and also storing carbon in the soils that they use for their products. So there's a lot of different definitions that are out there, but overall, I think what's important is we're thinking about how can we implement practices like cover cropping or different agroforestry practices or just even conservation tillage. So tilling your lands in a way that minimizes soil disturbance, these all can kind of fall under the umbrella of regenerative agriculture, which is really how can we improve our relationship with the lands that we're using to produce food, essentially. Right. And uh, the regenerative agriculture space, which is dominated largely by white men, in part due to the legacy of the Homestead Act and other structural injustices. I think most people tend to associate environmental justice issues with industrial activities, fence line communities, smokestacks, that's those sorts of images. How do environmental justice issues come into play when talking about nature-based carbon capture and removal? Environmental justice is everywhere, and it touches everything that has to do with climate. So land-based carbon removal is definitely not an exception. I think there are different components to environmental justice, which could be important to keep in mind. First, you have sort of local versus global versus intergenerational justice. Now, in that lens, when you think about nature-based solutions or land-based carbon removal, here in the U.S., I think first, people just don't have access to capital to even get started in the space. And that creates the ultimate barrier and why you're seeing it being predominantly white-dominated. Um, it's very expensive to own and operate land. And then also accessing loans is another hardship and oftentimes discriminatory. So that's like the first environmental justice issue we see in the land-based side. I think for those that actually then get access to the lands, those producers and forest land owners then have inequitable access to different technical and financial assistance programs, as I mentioned earlier. That also makes the idea of operating and converting your, your productions that much harder. And all of this really stems from just that longstanding culture of discrimination, predominantly here at the USDA. The history of policies at the USDA and just at many other agencies really serve large scale operations. So don't really keep in mind things like specialty crops or just small scale farms, the ones that are probably more owned by socially disadvantaged producers. And so that also adds an additional environmental justice issue and barrier to access. Right. When I read about the USDA plan recently for a billion dollars toward climate smart ag, it was commodity oriented, which means corn, soy, wheat, which means big ag, right? It's not towards uh, more local specialty crops. And even if you think uh, not just here in the U.S., but if you look globally, I mean, there's also significant environmental justice issues there that also impact the decisions we make here in the U.S. Um, so there's a lot of sort of global north south you know colonial dynamics that we're seeing come to play where there's predatory behavior from big agro businesses and food companies that are then going to global south countries and driving things like deforestation or enforcing poor labor conditions and all of it is really for the benefit of of wealthier countries when did the concept of climate justice hit home for you personally i started studying environmental science when I was doing my undergrad. So I was already interested in just this general space. But after my first year of my undergrad, um, I realized that my family back home uh, in East Africa, in Somalia, they were being hit by droughts that we had never seen before, very unprecedented. And as a result of that, my family who lived off of the lands and were herders and were nomads, uh, were no longer able to follow rainfall patterns and therefore couldn't herd their livestock and 
they faced a lot of crop failure as well. And the result of that was just a widespread famine that was honestly quite devastating. And I think that brought a lot of things into perspective for me. On one hand, I was sitting, uh, I'm from Canada. So I was sitting in Canada in my classroom and I'm learning all about these models and this impending climate crisis and things that are going to happen. And it was all numbers and it was very factual. And then on the other hand, I'm working with other Somali diaspora to support our families, whether it's through research or connecting them or translating whatever it was to address what was ultimately a climate crisis. And I think that just really brought a climate justice lens to the work that I do and has followed me throughout the rest of my career. How does this all tie back to your views on how to best implement carbon removal? So it makes me think of what are the governance structures that we need to put in place to really ensure that equity is at the forefront and the center of what we do, and that ultimately we're all rowing towards justice. I think on the land-based side, things that have come to mind for me, the first is specifically for Indigenous groups, which, again, they are the original stewards of the lands. They are the ones who came up with all of these practices that we're adopting now today. And I think using frameworks like free, prior, and informed consent and building that into any policy development or outreach that I do is critical. This has to be a collaborative effort. It's not one person that's going to be able to solve the climate crisis or figure out how to scale land-based carbon removal. So we need to find ways to uplift and fund and support public engagement and public input and just collaborative thinking. Really specifically, um, rerouting power to groups like community-based organizations to help lead and support outreach and, and decision-making. Ugbad Kosar is Deputy Director of Policy at Carbon 180. Thanks for coming on Climate One, Ugbad. Thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about natural methods of carbon removal. If you missed a previous episode or want to hear more of Climate One's empowering conversations, subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your pods. Coming up, we squelch into the boggy benefits of peat. It certainly is a lot cheaper than trying to grow a tree because a tree really needs fertilizer, it needs a lot of water, and the risk associated with growing a lot of trees, as we know, especially in places like California, is that you can burn 10 million of them down in a week, where it's very difficult to destroy a fen or a bog because they're just so resilient. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Ariana Brocious. When most people think of peat, they likely think of Scotland and whiskey. But peatlands exist in many parts of the world and can be a powerful tool in natural carbon sequestration. Peat is partially decayed vegetation that builds up over centuries. Peat lands, generally bogs, fens, swamps, and marshes, accumulate peat in waterlogged, oxygen-starved conditions, largely built on mosses. They can hold dramatically more carbon than trees, and they're also very resilient, except when disturbed by human activity. Ed Strusick is author of the book Swamplands, Tundra Beavers, Quaking Bogs, and the Improbable World of Peat. He described one of the most fascinating peatlands he visited for his book, on Banks Island in the very high Arctic. We passed through vast wetlands. We saw muskox in this shaggy, prehistoric-looking figure. There were peri caribou, Arctic fox, you know, hares, lemmings. Uh, there were rough-legged hawks and peregrine falcons nesting. It was just full of life. And uh, really, I was trying to figure out why it was so busy, why this was uh, such a biological hotspot when most of the uh, Arctic archipelago is a, is a desert. And the common denominator is really that it was peat. There's layers of peat uh, all across that uh, valley that are up to, you know, six feet, nine feet deep. And as every gardener knows, uh, peat really is a wonderful medium for growth. And so this was, you know, absolutely the beginning of uh, an exploration of peatlands from uh, all over the world, many of which we've lost, especially in the United States, where uh Probably about 80% of the peatlands have been drained over the uh, centuries. 
So where does restoring and preserving peatlands rank in terms of a carbon removal solution? It ranks as high as it possibly can, because if you think about it, peatlands, which represent only about 3% of the world's terrestrial surface, store twice as much carbon as all the world's forests combined. And if you look at particular peatlands, such as the Hudson Bay lowlands, which surround Hudson Bay in northern Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec, they're the largest intact peatland in the world. Uh, They store five times more carbon than the equivalent area in the Amazon rainforest. So as carbon storage uh, reservoirs, they're unmatched. How quickly can peatlands soak up carbon dioxide if they are restored or re-wetted? I think that the most important thing is not so much that they uh, uh, sequester it. Uh, they do so to, a, to some extent, not as effectively as trees. But what you do by rewetting it is you're keeping what's there in the ground. And I think that's really one of the more important parts of the equation is uh, finding ways of restoring degraded peatlands so they don't uh, emit more carbon dioxide than they are doing now. So what are the tipping points where peatlands and other sorts of swamplands go from being carbon reservoirs or sinks to carbon emitters? I think the biggest factors are when we start disturbing it. And it, you know, it does not like to be disturbed because once you dig up peat, it's exposed to oxygen, uh, it dries out, and the carbon just goes poof up in the air. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we face right now. And going back to, say, the Hudson Bay lowlands, which you know are probably the most important carbon reservoir in the world, uh, there are now, I think, over 1,800 mining claims in that area, and there are plans to build roads through it to get at those minerals. Um, and many politicians are very supportive of this because they think it's going to be the, the next great economic driver in the country. But if it goes ahead, it's going to release an awful lot of carbon. Yeah, as you've mentioned, humans have destroyed and drained a lot of the peatlands throughout the world. And in the U.S., Congress even passed multiple swamp acts in the mid-1800s to get rid of some of these lands. What were some of the reasons for that at the time? Well, it started off uh, with, you know, the Virginia settlers who had a plan in place. They ran out, uh, ran out of area to grow tobacco. And uh, there was the Great Dismal Swamp on the North Carolina border. And the idea was that if they could drain it, they could expand their agricultural area. Uh, and one of the first uh, companies to actually do this, corporations, was headed up by George Washington. And he used uh, enslaved labor including his own and his uh, business partners, to try and drain it. And uh, they weren't successful in growing crops. Uh, It just didn't work out that way. Uh, But what they did do was that they opened up enough area to cut down the uh, white cedars, the Atlantic white cedars, which extended all the way from Maine down to the Great Dismal Swamp in order to produce uh, cedar shake uh, shingles. And this went on. Congress invested in the company, and uh, Congress thought that this was a great idea, and they passed swamp acts in 18, what, uh, 59, 60, and 65 uh, for the purpose of clearing the land for agriculture and for lumbering. And they drained 65 million acres of swamplands in a very short period of time. So how much of that destruction this destruction of peatland continues today for uses like fuel or clearing land for agriculture? Still quite a bit. You know, in fact, surprising an awful lot. If you look at Finland, Ireland, Estonia, they get, you know, a, not a large percentage of their electrical power, but they get quite a bit of it from uh, peat. They burn peat to produce electricity. Uh, in Canada and Minnesota, there's an industry built around, you know, agricultural peat products. Uh, So that continues uh, to be done. Africa is now beginning to look at draining their big bogs to produce electricity uh, because they uh, are a growing population and they don't have a lot of uh, alternatives other than uh, renewable resources, which they're not investing in because they're costly and the World Bank is not supporting that. So we're seeing quite a bit of that going on. And in Indonesia, you know, they're they're draining peatlands to grow palm trees 
Is there just not a widespread awareness of the carbon value of peat? I mean, why why is this still being considered a fuel? You mentioned access to resources as one factor, but in places like in Europe, it would seem like they have other opportunities. They do. And, you know, Europe is uh, basically turning the tide, especially countries like Germany, the Netherlands, and Great Britain, the United Kingdom, uh, are as well. Uh, One of the reasons being is that they're running out of peat. Uh, You know, Germany, uh, the Netherlands have lost, I think, over 90% of their peatlands. And they're suffering the consequences, not just because it's carbon uh, that's been lost and trying to keep what's left in the ground. It's because by removing so much peat, they've lost an awful lot of biodiversity because there are so many critters in the world that rely on peatlands to nest. You know, for example, in North America, we have one to three billion birds representing over 300 species that fly, uh, you know, from the southern United States and South America to the boreal forest peatlands to to nest. And the other reason why Germany and the Netherlands and other countries are doing is because by removing so much peat over the centuries, they've dug themselves below sea level. And with sea levels rising, now they're having a huge inundation of, you know, storm surges that are swamping them. And so they're using peat as a method. Mosses like sphagnum can hold back 25% of their, or hold 25% of their weight in moisture. So this is a pretty good, you know, way of dealing with flooding uh, around the world. Europe is catching on. Russia is catching on as well because of the Siberian wildfires that have been out of control since about 2003, almost a yearly phenomenon now. But if you have a lot of moisture on the ground, as you would in a bog or a fan or a swamp or marsh, basically mother nature takes over. The fire just stops. And uh, we're only beginning to understand the value of these peatlands here in North America. We continue to take them for granted. Many uh, states and provinces in Canada focus on this idea of, you know, growing trees. You know, Canada is going to spend $4 billion to grow 100 million trees or something like that to try to deal with the climate crisis, um, which is good, fine. But I would say for your the bigger bang for your buck would be to restore peatlands, degraded peatlands, and protect what we have that are there. Well, to that point, in Canada, thousands of acres of wetlands have been already lost and destroyed due to the oil sands extraction industry, as you write about. And you explain that the restoration of those places after the industry is finished has taken the form of upland forests rather than restoring bogs and marshes. So what are the consequences of that in Canada? Well, you've lost, number one, the all the values that you have uh, that come, comes with peat. Um, it looks good. I mean, the the oil sands industry, you know, filled it up with dirt and planted grass and then put buffalo on top of them and the public bought it in into it and said, this is great. But it's an artificial environment. It's not the worst situation. It's certainly better than having a big hole left, uh, you know, to fill up with saline water. But it's really not providing the ecosystem services that a peatland would offer. There are wonderful water filters. They're nature's way of filtering water. And we know this because, you know, the Vikings and even the U.S. Navy used to use bog water on long voyages because when sphagnum dies, it releases these polyglycerides, which block bacterial growth. And this helps keep water fresh. And one of the reasons why the Great Lakes right now are suffering from so much algal blooms is because the Great uh, Black Swamp and the Waynefleet Bog in Canada, uh, you know, which surrounded Lake Erie, they've largely been drained. And so all of the agricultural land and the nutrients, you know, that uh, come with the with the fertilizer just go straight into the Great Lakes rather than being filtered by those peatlands, those bogs and marshes that used to surround the Great Lakes. Well, what makes it hard to grow a peatland from scratch, perhaps? Nothing, really. It uh, really doesn't need a heck of a lot because... Uh, If you think about it, it's an acidic environment, generally speaking. So it doesn't like nutrients. Nutrients will kill a bog or a fen, acidic bog or a fen. Uh, And so that's why all of the most of the life forms, such as the orchids, uh, get their food from the air. And so you don't need a lot of fertilizer. You just need a lot of water and you need the foundation for peat, those seeds for uh, the various mosses that are a foundation for peat. 
it's not expensive. I've seen it done. It's not perfect, uh, but I've seen where they've uh, managed to restore 87% of the plants that existed in a degraded peatland. It certainly is a lot cheaper than trying to grow a tree because a tree really needs fertilizer. It needs a lot of water. Uh, and the risk associated with growing a lot of trees, as we know, especially in places like California, is that you can burn 10 million of them down in a week, where it's very difficult to destroy a fen or a bog or even a marsh because they're just so resilient. Mosses are just they are a super plant. Almost nothing can kill it except if you remove the water. And even then, if you remove the water, it still stays alive. There's a friend of mine, a bryologist, uh, who extracted a 500-year-old uh, moss from a melting glacier in the high Arctic, and she regrew it back in her lab. So I think, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an economic question. Which is the cheaper way to go? I think we can go both ways with growing trees, but I think the most effective way is to restore peatlands because they have so many services that they provide, mitigating flooding, filtering water, stopping and slowing a wildfire, storing carbon, uh, and also being a refuge for you know many animals in a period of extreme drought or wildfire. What do scientists know about the durability of peatlands for carbon sequestration? You mentioned, you know, trees have this unfortunate consequence of burning and thus there goes your carbon. But how well will peatlands respond to an increasingly warmer climate? Well, there's no doubt it will be stressed. Um, and the question is, is that may just take a little bit of uh, engineering on our part uh, to keep diverting water into these areas because Temperatures are one factor, but I think the most important factor for peatlands is is the availability of water to keep things wet and moist so that mosses can continue to grow upward and outward. You know, places like the Great Dismal Swamp uh, in Virginia, North Carolina, they're building weirs to try to redirect the flow of water back into the peatlands. Uh, But in other parts of the world, they're reintroducing beavers, which, you know, we basically eliminated from most of the landscape in North America and much of Europe. And in Great Britain, especially in Scotland, they're having tremendous success because you don't have to do anything. Um, You just put the beaver in there, they build the dam, and they're basically nature's cheapest engineers. And California, I know, is beginning to look at this to deal with the wildfire problem uh, there. Uh, The idea here in North America is one of my favorites in in doing the research on this was that the idea of using beavers started where they were trying to expand agriculture, but the beavers kept coming in and flooding the agricultural areas and they would trap them, but it was just not working. So what they decided was that maybe what we'll do is transport them up into the highlands we can get the beavers to create these reservoirs of water for wildfire fighting purposes. So they, what they did, uh, this is a true story, is that they decided that they would transport uh, a bunch of beavers by donkey caravans. But it turned out the donkeys and beavers don't get along. And so someone came up with the idea, of, well, let's parachute them in, you know, in these wooden crates and then drop them down, and if the crate didn't break open, the beavers would chew their way out. And you know, you can't make this up, but the, the, the experimental beaver, the lead beaver, was named Geronimo. And it actually worked. And so I think, you know, this is the, the beaver may be our best friend here. Well, as you note in your book, peatlands are not that charismatic. They're, they've often been described as spooky, deceitful, buggy and muggy places. So how can we build more appreciation for peat and its preservation. So I think you begin with a bit of storytelling and then make people understand why we have these prejudices against peatlands, because many people did feel that they were haunts of ghosts, the will-o'-wisp and jack-o'-lanterns and the New Jersey devil, which is this crazy bird-like critter who, you know, would do terrible things to you. Um, and so we basically, it's a cultural thing. We, we've inherited this prejudice against swamplands We also believe that they were the uh, origin of diseases such as cholera. Uh, So the next thing that I just uh, ask people is visit a peatland sometime, and I think you'd be absolutely flabbergasted by how much you will see. 
certainly much more than you would see on a say a four or five day hike through the Rockies, uh, because you know and there's a there's a peatland, a very tiny one just outside uh, the city where I live, that have two thirds of all the orchids in Western North America that you can actually see. Uh, if you go there, you know, when they're blooming in May and June. And some of these orchids are the most enchanting things, like a lady slipper, you know, it really does look like a, uh, you know, a fairy cobbled this, this beautiful plant. There's a heck of a lot going on in the peatland that people just, you know, would never see anywhere else. Ed Strusick is author of Swamplands, Tundra Beavers, Quaking Bogs, and the Improbable World of Peat. Ed, thank you for joining us today on Climate One. Thank you. It was my pleasure. You're listening to a conversation about natural ways of sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. This is Climate One. Coming up, we hear from a kelp farmer. In climate solution space, we're caught between small is beautiful, sort of that Hudson Valley sort of small scale farming, which is wonderful, but it doesn't scale to have big impact. And then the other side is that big is necessary is what we're being told. You have to scale to address climate change. And I think there's there's something in between. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. We're talking about natural ways to capture carbon from the atmosphere. But first, I want to spend a little time talking about the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It details the very real threats and likely consequences of our climate trajectory, highlighting the current and future damages of human-caused climate disruption, especially on people and ecosystems least able to handle it. Benjamin Preston is a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation and one of the authors of the report, which UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. That quote reflects the frustration that a lot of people feel around the world in terms of, you know, our seeming inability to to come to terms with the the challenge that's in front of us. And we've known that it's bad for a long time, right? I mean, this story is kind of like, it's bad. Yeah, we know it's bad. But one part of the report that really stood out to me was a warning about, quote, cascading and compounding impacts. Think of California on fire and the electrical system shutting down, Australia with multiple uh, disasters, Texas freezing, and the water systems and sewage systems go out. Is modern society prepared for these cascading and compounding climate impacts? Yeah, I'd say it's a little bit of a yes and and no. The reality is this is often the way we experience impacts is they often come, you know, not in onesies and twosies, but in combinations. And I think a good example of that is COVID-19. So while we were trying to deal with COVID-19 locally and globally, we're also having to deal with um, climate-related disasters and and other other types of threats. That said, I think it's pretty clear and the report is, is quite clear that this combination of events, this combination of threats is sort of increasingly testing the limits of our ability to, ability to manage risk. Last August, when Working Group One came out with its report, headlines around the world screamed, code red for humanity. What effect do you think that had and what effect do you think this report will have? You know, I've been working on climate change for 20 years, and I think we've really seen a groundswell of concern, of attention, Within the past several years, I think since 2015, when you know, we, the world passed uh, the Paris Climate Agreement and agreed to limit warming, everywhere we look, whether it's headlines, whether it's protests in the street, we see governments, the general public, the private sector, corporations all step, stepping up and sort of declaring like we're in a crisis. We have a climate emergency um, and we have to do something about it. And so I think, you know, there's definitely this sort of tide has turned. Obviously, it turned a long time ago, but I think we really are in sort of a tipping point on climate change. But I think people are realizing that the risks are very real. They're upon us. And, and again, we're behind in sort of getting out in front of this particular challenge. You know, we're starting to see that in terms of people's rhetoric and in terms of policy. The report notes a, quote, brief and rapidly closing window for action. You have modeled decarbonization of the U.S. economy by 2050. Can we get there? How can we get there? It's, it's a tough challenge. Um, I think many people don't really understand sort of the scale of change and transformation that has to happen, not just you know on the energy sector, but on energy, on industries, on land use. 
you know, we're talking big societal changes in order to limit warming to less than two degrees or, or less than 1.5 degrees. That said, I think I've seen a lot of evidence that makes me confident, optimistic about what lies ahead. Our emissions right now, both in the U.S. and sort of globally, are lower than we would have anticipated uh, a decade ago. And I think we're seeing real investment and interest in how do we enhance our resilience to both the climate we have today and the climate we're going to have tomorrow. So are we going to meet all of our targets by 2030 and 2050? I think that remains to be seen. But, you know, I think it's really up to us to make those decisions and increase our ambition. And we have seen nations around the world increasingly ratcheting down their emissions, increasing their ambition, increasing investments in resilience, increasing support for developing countries that are most vulnerable. So cautious optimism, I would say. Yeah, I just want to hold on to that for a moment on this day when we're seeing this this report, which is quite unsettling, and that, that you are seeing some optimism. Though under the current national policies, heating will reach an average estimate of about 2.7 degrees Celsius warming by 2100, according to Climate Impact Tracker. We can get to 2.4 if countries fulfill their official pledges and goals. That's still too high. And the people who contributed least to the problem are most vulnerable. What does the report say about climate justice and equity? For me, that's one of the big take-home messages from this particular report is that message of equity, of fairness, of, of justice uh, comes through quite strongly, uh, particularly in, in my chapter that I co-led, which is really on sort of the intersection of, of climate action, sustainable development. The way we really frame this is that, you know, if you want to achieve big reductions in emissions, if you want to enhance resilience, if you want to really boost and accelerate the pursuit of sustainable development, you know, those are all ambitious objectives, worthy objectives. But in order to get there, you really have to think about equity and inclusion in that pursuit. That means bringing everybody along. You can't leave individual nations, certain segments of society on the sidelines. The solutions have to work for, for everyone. And, and absolutely, and this has been a consistent message from the IPCC for years, which is that those of us that are most vulnerable and you know, either we're, whether we're talking about people or ecosystems are the ones that are going to bear the brunt of uh, climate change both now and in the future. And therefore, we need to prioritize protection, consideration, and support for those vulnerable individuals, communities, regions, cities uh, moving forward if we're really to have a hope of getting on top of emissions, limiting warming, and enhancing our resilience. You led the chapter on climate resilient development pathways. What synergies and trade-offs do you see between adaptation, mitigation, and sustainable development? You know, we talk about climate change, we, we often look at it fairly narrowly, right? We're trying to anticipate how the climate's going to change and how do we respond to the risks that emerge. But, you know, our chapter, what we're trying to do is take a little bit step back from that and say, yes, we need to address climate change, but we also globally need to continue to lift people out of poverty. We need to provide air quality and water quality. We need to protect ecosystems, whether on land or in the oceans. We need to provide education, provide health care. These are all big development agendas and have been for, for quite some time. And so what we try to do is sort of look at how do we tackle the climate change in the context of some of these types of objectives. The issue is if you, if you don't design your policies carefully, there's also the potential for trade-offs, right? So, for example, if, if we adapt to a change in climate simply by pouring concrete everywhere and hardening our environment, hardening our infrastructure, you know, what does that do? Well, it further degrades ecosystems and nature, which is already under pressure from a change in climate. So we're worried about you know, poorly designed policies actually exacerbate vulnerability, exacerbate inequities. And I think the report overall is fairly clear that it's possible to take advantage of the synergies and avoid a lot of the trade-offs. But again, some of the devil's in the detail and how we design and think about policies, when we implement them, where we implement them, what we choose to do is going to have a big influence on whether we see more of the synergies or more of the trade-offs. Benjamin Preston is a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation and one of the authors of the most recent IPCC assessment report. Ben, thanks for sharing your insights as we absorb this heavy report. My pleasure. It's been great. 
the oceans have been absorbing huge amounts of carbon dioxide for decades, protecting us from mind-blowing amounts of climate disruption. Though their ultimate capacity is limited, some are exploring kelp as another nature-based method of carbon sequestration and a sustainable source of food. Kelp, or macroalgae, absorbs lots of carbon as it grows, and then when it dies, it falls to the sea floor, where it can stay for decades or longer. It's unclear how much carbon is stored because few scientific studies have directly measured that process. Some companies are even trying to harvest and bury kelp to accelerate carbon storage. Today, we're featuring an excerpt in collaboration with another climate podcast, Heat of the Moment, a partnership between foreign policy and the climate investment funds. Host John Sutter brings us the story of Bren Smith, a former commercial fisherman turned regenerative ocean farmer. I met Bren Smith once before. I spent some time on his boat as he made his way down the coast from Connecticut to Manhattan to take part in the 2015 People's Climate March. A few things struck me about Smith right away. Here was this guy trying to reorient the way that people think about and use the oceans, yet he's not really an environmentalist or a foodie. I also found it fascinating that he's a person who spends a ton of time out on the water, yet he doesn't know how to swim. Yes, I don't know how to swim. But uh, <laughs> most fishermen, northern fishermen, don't know how to swim. Like, what are we going to, like, can we say it prolongs your death? But I'm also allergic to shellfish. So I like, this is a, like how dumb a job for me. Like, I'm allergic to shellfish. I can't swim. I don't like kelp. Right. And I don't like hanging out with environmentalists all the time. (laughs) (laughs) And and here you are. It's funny because I don't think of myself as an environmentalist. And it's because just culturally where I come from. My parents were American, but I was born and raised in Newfoundland, Canada, a little fishing outport. It was the most eastern point in all of North America. And you can imagine it was like that. It was the ultimate artisanal fishery. It was the fisherman's co-op next door. All the houses were painted with leftover boat paint. So like greens, oranges, reds. We were selling cod tongues door to door. And all I ever wanted to be was a fisherman. And I, you know, I look back and I wonder why, you know, why didn't I want to be an astronaut or, or something? And it was because I'd see them go out in the morning and they own their own boats. They have these self-directed lives. They succeeded and failed on their own terms and they had this pride of feeding their country right it, it just seemed to me as a little kid it was a soul-filling job so so that's what I did and I dropped out of high school much to my parents horror and headed out to sea at the age of 14. So what did that feel like at the time I imagine it, it was it sounds like dangerous in some ways exciting what was your perspective then versus you know what you know now about like kind of the bigger picture of what's going on with fisheries? in the 1980s and I think all of society was in a like a boom of resources right and it just seemed like the fish were endless and we could just hunt and hunt the seas forever and then also this incredible solidarity of just being like part of a a tribe really of people that are out there chasing fish around the globe so that was it was so different in that now I still want that job like a climate job that we can write and sing songs about that's soul filling Mm -hmm but one that is not extracted. But I just didn't have a, an awareness then. And, you know, it just wasn't a discussion in the industry. And now it's, you know, it talked about all the time in the boats, you know, how, where the fish are, how, whether we should be fishing and what the industry should look like. What was going through your mind at the time? I imagine it's amazing life being out at sea in that way. Yeah, I mean, you know, although I see my life as one of, you know, ecological redemption, I don't regret that time. I mean, you know, a lot of people treat sort of fishermen and coal workers. So those of us that were working in the extractive economy, almost as criminals, like we're to blame. Mm. But we weren't to blame. Society was to blame the captains of industry, governments that were subsidizing large factory fleets. And I just was doing something I loved. And fishermen are, you know, the last hunters on earth for a commercial food. And we should really, really honor that. It can't Uh, look and act the same way, but it's a beautiful way to make a living. Was it a moment that led to sort of a change of career and change of direction for you? Because you're no longer fishing in the same ways that you were. So when I was on the Bering Sea, the cod stocks crashed back in Newfoundland. And that was one of the first big collapses of the fishery. 30,000 people thrown out of work. It was the largest layoff in Canadian history. And it is amazing to see an economy built up over a hundred years, just decimated overnight, like fishermen walking like hungry ghosts on the streets, canneries emptied and boats beached. And, And that had a huge effect on me. 
there had been many people talking about overfishing in the environmental conservation community, but like, you know, they presented it as birds, bees, and bears, just like they talk about climate change. <laughs> and that's, that does not resonate with those of us that are trying to make a living. But what I realized when the cod stocks crashed was like, oh, there aren't gonna be any jobs on a dead ocean. Like, of course there won't be any food, but there actually won't be a job. So this is kitchen table issues. And that's when that Achilles heel of environmentalism, right? Jobs versus the environment, that just dissipated. And I realized that I had to figure out a way to work with the ocean, be a steward in order to make a living on a living planet. Hmm. That's a big realization, right? The no jobs on a dead ocean and to align in some ways with environmentalists who had seemed to be at odds with you and the fishing community previous to that. When was this and, and what was that like for you? There's this moment of hopelessness that you think like this is the end of a way of life. So for me, first it was filled with sadness and seeing a culture begin to disappear, right? You know, like suddenly the song shift to the cod being gone and that, you know, you go to Newfoundland and that's, that's a refrain you're hearing all the time in the, in the bars and the shanties that are sung now. And that's just absolutely heartbreaking. That makes me also think about quote, just transition for people who work in fossil fuel industries, but also in fisheries, frankly, and what happens to workers who will be laid off as jobs change or might need retraining or that kind of thing. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. I mean, I'll tell you what a just transition is not. There's a story we always pass around in Newfoundland, which is, you know, the, the fish plant closes and this woman from New York comes up and she's going to uh, repurpose the cannery and hire everybody and bring jobs back to the community. And the community asks, okay, this is so exciting. There's a meeting and they ask, what's the, you know, what are we going to be making? And she says, seatbelts for pets. Right? <laughs> and that's not a just transition. That is a soulless, empty job, right? And we don't want that. We're not going to go to work for that. The other side of what just transition isn't is this other story that's told, which is a uh, fisherman gets a great buyout. His boat is beached. But it's a really great chunk of money. Um, he buys a new truck and every morning he wakes up at four, drives down to the docks and drinks himself to death, right? This isn't about money. So it's not about any job and it's not just about cash. This is actually about a meaning and culture. And those jobs that need just transition are those jobs that people write and sing songs about, like the farmers, the coal workers, the steel workers, the fishermen. There's a reason they're, they have these iconic roles and there aren't any good songs about lawyers out there. There are tons of good <laughs> songs about fishermen and, and uh, farmers and, and coal workers. And so those are the jobs we need, those soul-filling jobs. And, th and the question is why? Like it's agency that there is a deficit in the economy. So I've, I've seen you described as a, a 3D ocean farmer. Can you tell me what you, A, if you'd like to be described that way, and, and B, like what does that mean exactly? Yeah, so I mean it's funny. The industry is new enough that we're still searching around what to call it. Now, you know, I'm thinking of myself much more as a regenerative ocean farmer, very much like the regenerative land-based farming. And I think what makes it different, if you ask the ocean this really simple question, you're like, okay, what does it make sense to grow? The ocean says to you, why don't you grow things that you don't have to feed and don't swim away? Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start thinking the ocean is a unique agricultural space and not growing around markets, and as soon as you take that view, there are 10,000 plants in the ocean, hundreds of kinds of shellfish that require zero inputs. And that's really powerful, not only environmentally, but also uh, from a farmer's perspective, it just means lower overhead and less capital to get started. And we actually sent a producer to survey Brent Smith's ocean farm. So this hauler can haul a lot of weight. His farm manager, Jill Pegnataro, demonstrated how they use a pulley to harvest the kelp. And so when you think of our farms, I uh, think of it as almost like an underwater garden. We have anchors on the edges of the farm and then ropes up to the surface, to buoys, and then horizontal lines down below, a rope scaffolding system. And from there, we just grow as many crops as we can. We grow our kelp, which is a type of seaweed, scallops, mussels, oysters, and really take a polyculture approach. And there are a couple benefits to this. One is that it's all underwater, so it's a low aesthetic impact. Like you come out, I run these eco tours. You come out to the farm, and there's like nothing to see. It feels like a total <laughs> ripoff. There's just some buoys, right? People are expecting to see all this stuff. Uh, but that's good. The oceans are these beautiful, pristine places, and we really want to keep them that way. So that low aesthetic impact is really key. There was a great 
study that came out that showed if you were to take less than 4% of U.S. waters to farm seaweed, so networks of farms up and down the coast, you could offset the entire agricultural carbon emissions of California. Mm. And importantly, it's scalable. Like in climate solution space, we're caught between small is beautiful, sort of that Mm. Brooklyn artisanal food, Hudson Valley sort of small scale farming, which is wonderful, but it doesn't scale to have big impact. And then the other side is that big is necessary is what we're being told. You have to scale to address climate change. And I think there's there's something in between, which is really models around scaling for replication and using natural production like cultivating kelp um, to sequester carbon and nitrogen, things like that. So we really believe in the scale, but we really want to do it the right way. Tell me a little bit more about your vision for what like happens with the kelp. It sounds like part of the idea is to grow kelp for kelp's sake in the sense that it, it keeps carbon in the ocean or, or stores it in the ocean yeah. floor. If I were to like wave a magic wand and, and sort of imagine what the industry could be at scale, uh, it would be a reimagining of the marine protected zones. Like marine protected zones right now is a strategy. You don't touch them. It's conservation and you let them be and you shouldn't do any activity. And I think that's actually a form of climate denial. Like you could do conservation on the entire oceans and they'd still die because of climate change. Like you need some activity breathing life back into the oceans. And so what I think where the the future is, is let's call them blue carbon zones, where you take 2000 acres um, and you do partial reforestation, you're growing food, um, uh, uh, you're doing artisanal fisheries and ecotourism, and then you replicate these new national monuments, blue carbon zones up and down the coast. Like, I think that's that's the way we turn our oceans into a, into a real force for climate solutions. This is a significant part of, again, this kind of climate math, right? If you're able to, with ocean farming offset, uh, like a sizable amount of of CO2 emissions. I I guess I wonder what it's like for you when you think about like the scale of of what's going on, if it's like an exciting challenge or if it is daunting and frustrating that there's just, you know, so much pollution that's still happening in terms of the atmosphere and a lot that needs to be drawn back. You know, where the hope comes from at this point is that humans are pretty good when their backs are against the wall and we get really good at things quickly. So for, you know, the, what happened with fishing was we got too good at fishing right? and let's just get too good at climate solutions. Mm. But uh, what I'm actually worried about is that we de-link addressing climate change with addressing inequality mm. and sort of the deep injustices in our economy. Like the exciting thing about this is that we kind of have a blank slate and we can do food right. We can do agriculture right. And we actually build something beautiful out in the ocean. And if we have to keep link, like solving climate change can, we can draw down carbon while we lift up communities. And if we keep those together, we'll get the political buy-in we need for policy and for armies of people going out there every day with their blue collar innovation to address climate change. That was Bren Smith, an ocean farmer and co-founder of the nonprofit Green Wave, talking with John Sutter, host of the Heat of the Moment podcast. Find a link to their recent series on our website. Today on Climate One, we've been talking about natural forms of carbon sequestration. Next time, we'll discuss tech solutions for pulling carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be complicated, awkward, difficult, and it's also critical to address the climate emergency. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review on Apple. Or tell a friend. It really does help open up and advance the climate conversation. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Colon. Our audio engineer is Arnav Gupta. Our team also includes Steve Fox and Tyler Reed. Our theme music was composed by George Young and arranged by Matt Wilcox. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.